Hey everybody, this is Adam Brown of Liberations Republic I, coming to you from the Voluntary Virtues Network. Again, thank you Michael Shanklin for granting me this opportunity and giving me this great platform that is so much bigger than my own. Uh, it's really just an honor and a privilege to be able to discuss the concepts of liberty, anarchism, the non-aggression principle, free market economics, and, and all these wonderful things uh, in a group of like-minded people who are reaching out to those who might not understand or even know about some of these concepts. Uh, the title of the show is Bitcoins, Hotels, and How to Discuss Anarchism in a Customer Service Setting. Uh, now, as many of you may or may not know, uh, I do work in a hotel. I work in a hotel here in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. I will not include the name of the hotel uh, in this video uh, simply because of the fact that you can go to my Facebook page, check it out, uh, and any views and uh, statements made by me is not indicative of anybody in the hotel industry, uh, my hotel in particular, the ownership group of my hotel, the brand that owns uh, the ownership group, uh, as well as uh, Expedia.com, which I will discuss here shortly. Um, I saw an interesting article uh, while I was just flipping through the news, uh, and I saw an article about uh, Bitcoins and Bitcoin apps being reaccepted into Apple. And scrolling through that article, there was a link that showed that Expedia is now embracing and legitimizing Bitcoin. Uh, so from CNET.com, the article says uh, Expedia.com embraces and legitimizes Bitcoin. Bruised by a series of business problems earlier this year, Bitcoin stands to recover some of its... Uh, Ah, oh, fuck. Alright, just enough time to edit. Alright. Bruised by a series of business problems earlier this year, Bitcoin stands to recover uh, some of its losses. Travel site Expedia said Wednesday that it's accepting payments made in the virtual currency. Bitcoins enable electronic purchases even though the currency isn't linked to any particular country. It's got technophiles excited, but its shift toward the mainstream has been difficult over the last year. But Expedia sees Bitcoin as just another payment mechanism, and people now can reserve hotel accommodations at this site through a partnership with Bitcoin transaction processor Coinbase. Other Expedia booking services such as cars and airplane flights will get Bitcoin support later, said Michael Goldman, Expedia's vice president of global product. Bitcoin is becoming a viable currency, Goldman said. This is no different from going into any market, understanding how we can do business, and offering the forms of payment customers want. Actually, it's more than that. Here we have a major e-commerce site lending its brand clout to a new technology and making its sizable customer base aware that it believes Bitcoin is legitimate, not risky. That could reassure people to come on in. The Bitcoin water is fine. It does make Bitcoin a little more serious, Goldman said. From our viewpoint, Bitcoin is young, but it is a cryptocurrency that's here to stay. Expedia's faith contrasts with Bitcoin's difficult growth along its, uh, beyond its early uber-technical niche. In 2013, the price of Bitcoin soared over uh, $1,000 as speculators, and perhaps market manipulating programs dubbed uh, Willie and Marcus, drove up its value. Shortly afterward, the value plunged to half of the high water mark. That volatility, combined with the bankruptcy problems of an exchange site called Mt. Gox, where people could buy and sell Bitcoins for ordinary currency, didn't reassure anyone worried about Bitcoin stability. There's something else in it for Expedia, too. Purchases made in Bitcoins have lower transaction fees than those using payment cards that typically charge between 2 and 4%, uh, Goldman said. That's not the main reason the company embraced Bitcoin, especially since the initial sales volume will be small, but it helps. However, he added, as Bitcoin becomes more widely accepted, we expect those transaction costs to go up a little bit. Goldman sees Bitcoin as analogous to eBay's electronic payment service PayPal, which rose to fame in the 1990s. I remember when PayPal was a strange thing. You'd use an email address to send money from one person to another. Now PayPal is fairly mainstream. He said, The path Bitcoin is on is in some ways what PayPal was on. At first it seemed strange, something that only the technocentric crowd uses, but then it's going to become more mainstream. Coinbase uh, processes transactions for Expedia, uh, meaning that customers, combine, customers purchasing services with Bitcoins will use Coinbase's services. That also means Expedia is sheltered from some of the volatility risks of Bitcoin, since it gets paid in or ordinary currency after the transaction is complete. Coinbase has the largest e-commerce presence and the largest customers. As we started dipping a toe in the water, Coinbase was a natural choice for us. In the U.S., the vast majority of customers pay with credit cards, but many other forms of payment are popular in other countries, and Bitcoin is particularly popular in Southeast Asia. He said, I expect a as a percentage of overall payments, uh, that we will get the quickest uptick, he said. Some economists have bashed bitcoins and some countries have issued warnings. Goldman is more sanguine. Uh, any currency is as valuable as people believe it is. 
As a former economist, I've studied these things. Currencies today aren't backed by gold. It really comes down to whether general consumers have the belief that this currency is a valid form of trading between people. If I give you this, will you give me something else? Bitcoin has passed the bar. You can get goods and services or trade it for legal, legal tender, Goldman said. Some economists may rail against it or say it's speculative. They're right. It's speculative. That doesn't mean it's not a valued currency. And that ends the article. Uh, one thing that really strikes me is Goldman sounds at least fairly Austrian. He understands that all Bitcoin is and all money is, is a method of exchange. It's an intercessor in between uh, the good that I want and what you want in return for it. As we all know that just the straight barter system really doesn't work out too well anymore, especially not when you know I don't necessarily have the chicken that you want uh, and you don't necessarily have the pickle that I want. I know that's kind of odd, just the first thing that came to my mind. It's one of the illustrations I've used for a while. So definitely shoot me a, uh, a message in the comment section below or shoot me an email. Let me know what you think about this article, uh, what you think about uh, Expedia. Really, give me a stamp of approval onto Bitcoin. I think this is a great step forward. And being somebody who works in the hotel industry myself, I am super excited. Now, I got it through the system that my company uses to gather in reservations and, and do all the interior hotel things. There's no way for me to know if somebody's used Bitcoin. Uh, but I do have a belief that uh, I'll be able to track down some of you. Because if, if any of you guys come to my hotel, I know you guys are going to be on Bitcoin. That's just, I know how you guys think. I know how you guys work, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, so please, if you are ever going to be in the Cape Girardeau area, contact me by email. I can send you a uh, link to a discount site. Actually, no, since I have to use Expedia, you're already getting a discount already. Uh, so use your Bitcoins, shoot me an email, I will make sure you're well taken care of. And speaking of hotels, you really don't have an appreciation for the people that work at the front desk uh, until you actually get to have a conversation with them. And that's something that happened with me tonight. I work the overnight shifts on the weekends, and uh, last couple of days I've been able to do a Friday and a Monday as well, uh, just because of the way my other overnight guy uh, needed some time off. Uh, so during these shifts, there's obviously very little human interaction. We're cleaning up the hotel. We're doing back-end paperwork and all that fun stuff. But every once in a while, I get a guest that comes down and wants to chit-chat. Sometimes it's about sports. Sometimes it's about them and their family and whatever situation they've had. Uh, because our hotel is extended stay focused, we get families. We get uh, victims of fires. We get people who are here on business for 90 days. We get doctors, lawyers, the whole nine. Um, this particular individual is a regular uh, guest of ours. He stays about four or five days a week uh, over the course of the last six or seven months or so. Uh, and this guy, one second here, I'm sorry. Just getting more comfortable. Love my recliner. Anyways, um, we got chit-chatting, and, and he brought up the whole Cantor getting unseated uh, from his uh, congressional seat uh, by losing in the primaries. And now, granted, I don't know very much about the situation. I've seen a, an article or two that I've just skimmed through. And I know some of you guys have done some very wonderful commentary on it. Uh, and I know Michael Shanklin's probably done a lot of great work on it already. Um, but my guest, he basically said, hey, <laughs> I know you're uh, libertarian focused, but, you know, what do you think about Eric Cantor losing? And I was like, you know, I have to hide in my little happy dance that Eric Cantor loses to someone who claims to be somewhat libertarian, uh, to uh, Mr. David Bratt uh, and his 23-year-old uh, libertarian-leaning uh, Mises Institute supporting, apparently, uh, campaign manager. And that kind of brought into the conversation. I said, well, you know, it's great that uh, Eric Cantor is basically getting his ass thrown out, but he's still getting replaced by another politician who you know, may go a similar route of Ron Paul uh, in that he's more education-focused, but even Ron Paul wasn't perfect. You know, he still did things that are very much against libertarian thoughts, and especially the non-aggression principle. Um, he said, well, what, what's this non-aggression principle? Uh, what do you mean? I said, well, it's really that simple. This simple. Don't be an asshole. Do not aggress against somebody else. That means don't hurt them, don't take their shit. 
don't kick their dog, don't rape their wife, don't punch them in the face, and don't steal their Ferrari. You just don't do that shit. It's a respect for property rights and the self-ownership of that person's own body. You don't mess with that shit. You work cooperatively with everybody that you can, and where you have differences with people, you move on. It's really that simple. And I said, you know, in an anarchist society, there is no government. Obviously, you know, by its namesake, and by following the non-aggression principle, it's not going to eliminate all the problems, it's not going to eliminate all the evil. Uh, but it's going to be a significant step forward uh, in helping combat, you know, all, all the major problems in the world, which, in my belief, stem from government. Uh, now, granted, Stefan Molyneux takes the position that it even goes as far back, and I would tend to agree that it's poor parenting, um, you know, namely child abuse, spanking, uh, yelling, and not using negotiation and thoughtful logic to help uh, bring your child up in the way that they should go. Um, but government is really the problem that we need to focus on at the moment. Um, you know, because without governments, there's no wars. He said, well, how so? Wouldn't it be that, you know, private factions of different companies would go and just battle out like you see in all those movies? And I said, well, no. That's not how it works. You know, you try telling, you know, let's just say you owned 30 houses. You, you own a neighborhood. And for some reason, you hate my neighborhood. You know, I, you know, I'm saying some nasty things about you, or we have our streets all ass backwards, or you know, we've got things that you guys don't have. You know, whatever. Doesn't matter the reason because obviously, <laughs> the government doesn't ever really give any good reasons for war, anyways. So I said, you know, you try going to all of your, your households and say, hey, I need. $150,000 from each of you so we can fund this war effort so I can go and destroy the fuck out of these people over here, take them over, and turn them into us. You're not going to get that money. It's not going to happen. There may be one or two backers, but when a majority of those people are going to be basically like us, you know, kind of upper middle class or middle class type people, or maybe even some lower class people as far as uh, income is concerned, they're not going to have the money for it. They're not going to have any issue with what I'm doing. Uh, and they're not going to give a damn, you know, how my streets swirl this way or how all our houses are pink and purple with red polka dots. Uh, they're just not going to care. And they say, uh, no. Uh, and it's much like uh, Stefan Molyneux said that bitcoins, if turned into, if uh, used as a, as a currency uh, in place of the dollar, and if all government currencies and all governments were to collapse uh, and disappear, there would be no more war. Because... You couldn't fund all these wars with Bitcoin. It just wouldn't happen. And he said, oh, okay. You know, that makes sense, but what happens with terrorists? And I said, well, what, what is terrorism? And he defined it as, uh, you know, individuals committing crimes uh, for the sake of political gain. And I said, you, do you see the, the key point that you just said? Political gain. And he said, well, yeah, what do you mean? And I said, well, political gain insinuates a state, insinuates a government. There is no government. All these are then are private crimes that may be, you know, en masse, but just because there is no rulers does not mean there is no rules. Remember the non-aggression principle, right? That is something that can be basically set into stone and, you know, private judicial groups and dispute resolution uh, organizations and insurance companies can work to ensure that these don't happen. And, you know, I told him, I'm no expert in how law or defense or or any kind of judicial group, uh, how they should interact, how they should do things. I couldn't fucking tell you if I wanted to. I, that That's not my cup of tea. You know, my knowledge base is, is retail, customer service, hospitality, and, you know, maybe one day food service if I get bored and want to go and wait tables for <laughs> a couple of months just to see what happens. And he was like, okay, interesting, interesting. And he was asking me all sorts of sources, and he was asking me, you know, because I told him, you know, I'm going to be recording this YouTube video today. And I didn't know what I was going to talk about until I had this conversation with him. Uh, and it was just so happy and so enlightening to have a guest who was so willing and open to have a dialogue on this. You know, he brought up roads, he brought up defense, law, judicial stuff. He brought up all of those arguments, but not from a... Oh, but what about my roads? It was more of a, you know, okay, here's an idea. 
what's the official position on, on Rhodes, this or that? And I said, well, the beautiful thing about anarchy is there is no official position. You know, you, you may think that the government's the only one that can do the roads, but, you know, we, the per people who build the roads for the government kind of still have the skills and the know-how to build the roads after. Now, how they would be maintained, how they would be priced, how you would pay for them, I don't know. But again, that's not my expertise. That's somebody else's expertise. You know, maybe perhaps I'll go and learn how to, you know, properly manage roads and all that, and then I'll become an entrepreneur in that field. But that's not, that's not me. And 45 minutes later, you know, he came down around 4 or 5 o'clock and finished up right towards the tail end of 5 o'clock, early into 6 o'clock, something like that. Uh, I don't know. Time has kind of melded together since I've been up for way too damn long. But I do this, guys, for, I do this for you guys. You know, it's, I, I love doing content now. Uh, especially with Michael Shanklin just breathing life into me. Anyways, enough, enough butt kissing. <laughs> um, he said, all right, give me some literature. Give me the YouTube channel that you're a part of uh, and the network you're a part of. Uh, give me everything that you have. So I listed off Voluntary Virtues, this, uh, you know, a number of the other shows, you know, We Are Deceived and some of the other ones that are featured as featured channels on the, on the sidebar here. Uh, Stefan Molyneux. Uh, Tom Woods, the Mises Institute, Lou Rockwell, all of those. And in fact, since I recently ordered uh, against the state a libertarian or a, an anarcho-capitalist manifesto, I should say, by Lou Rockwell, I'm going to give him that copy that I just purchased because uh, I've already got an ebook version of it, anyways. Uh, so, and he he is so interested in learning. Uh, he he's not quite convinced yet, and you know, granted, when I was in his similar position years ago. You know, I wasn't 100% convinced, you know, on the merit of some guy who happens to be extremely convinced about it, just says that it's going to work, and just says that the beautiful magic of the free market is going to solve all these problems, you know, that people are creative and that they will solve all of this. You know, he's actually going to go and do the research, which is just amazing to me. You know, I've never seen anybody quite so receptive like him, at least since I've been, you know, in a pseudo-public spotlight with these sort of things. If you guys see my uh, anarcho-communism debunk video, you'll see a bunch of ANCOMs and other statists <laughs> trying to pick apart the very simple analysis that uh, my friend gave uh, that he and I were talking through before we shot the video. So this, this brings me to my point of discussing anarchism in a customer service setting. If you work in a, in a setting where you're not necessarily tied to a desk, you're not sitting down in an office space, or you got to plug away at a computer for eight hours, and you can actually get the occasional downtime to spend time to converse with a guest on this issue, that issue, or whatever, do it. Don't be afraid. You know, maybe some conversations will get shut down, just like that. You never know. But in many cases, if you approach it from the first principle of the non-aggression principle, and discuss how, because the government aggresses against us, takes our wealth through taxation, and forces individuals to go to war, as what happened, you know, many, many years ago, they start, the scales start to fall from their eyes, as the saying goes around here. Uh, it's, it's just so beautiful to see their eyes just even come slightly open. It's like a little puppy just starting to be able to see, not really understanding the surroundings yet, but starting to get the vision. So I highly encourage you, do not shy away from the opportunity to go ahead and just just talk about it. Just do it. Again, worst case scenario, you'll get shut down right away or you'll get yelled at or laughed at. That's it. You know, if you are sincere and you aren't assholish in their face about it, they're not going to go and complain to a supervisor and say, oh, this guy's a bad person. He's trying to talk about anarchy and chaos and uh, death. And when you show the love that voluntarism, anarchism, anarcho-capitalism, whatever you want to call it, and when you show the love that's behind it, and the fact that getting the government out of the way of the poor people will solve our a lot of our problems, or at least get it to where these people will solve their own problems, uh, take part in their own lives, take responsibility for their own actions, it'll just be a much more beautiful world to live in. Uh, now, we're going to end this show uh, with a segment that I had a full show doing 
when I say full show, they were five minute clips uh, called Tyranny Spotlight. And this Tyranny Spotlight is going to be discussing the minimum wage uh, as we just recently, I know this has been weeks ago, Seattle just had their $15 minimum wage increase. Uh, so I'm going to go through a few of the numbers that I've compiled and we're going to discuss that briefly. And then I'm going to, you know, have a call for different questions, comments, uh, ideas, or if there's any statements you would like me to put in the videos from you guys uh, for the next episode next week. And that said, I would like you all to comment, email, all that stuff. The info is going to be in the description bar below. Uh, comment down below, please, for the love of God. Uh, I would like to see some interaction uh, on this show. Uh, yeah, I know I'm not that popular. I know I'm not the greatest orator. I'm not, I'm not the best guy out there. Fuck Michael Shanklin and, and Randall Parker Jr. and the guy who does uh, The State Sucks and Liberty Geek. All those guys, they're fucking phenomenal. I can't hold a candle to these guys yet, but I hope to perfect my craft uh, and make the show what you guys want it to be. Uh, so, uh, with no further ado, we will cut over to Tyranny Spotlight on the minimum wage. Alright, welcome to segment Tyranny Spotlight. Uh, today we're shining the spotlight onto the minimum wage. I've already done a video on this um, back right around a year ago, I want to say. Uh, and you can find that on my channel, youtube.com slash liberate the republic. I'd urge you to check that out. I go into maybe a little bit more detail, not too much more, I don't think. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, Rothbard's analysis of the minimum wage. And then talk about a Forbes article, or at least a, a segment out of a Forbes article, um, talking about uh, the recent effects of the minimum wage. Uh, so, what is the minimum wage? Well, according to Rothbard, and is, as is logical, uh, he called it compulsory unemployment. Uh, that is to say that it is illegal and therefore criminal to hire anyone else below the level of X dollars an hour. This means plainly and simply that a large number of free and voluntary wage contracts are now outlawed, and hence that there will be a large amount of unemployment. That just makes sense. When you set a minimum wage or a minimum cost for, uh, for employment, people who can't quite meet that threshold, people who can't reach up to that level, they're either going to get terminated or they're never going to find a job. You know, when you go into a job, you know, whether you've got a doctorate in you, or you've got uh, a high school graduation, or a GED, or maybe you've never even finished high school. More often than not, you're going to try to go in entry level, at least somewhere, at least once in your life. And you can't walk in and say, oh, I need to be making thirty-five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year, entry level. That's just not going to happen. You don't have the skills, necessarily, uh, to go ahead and do that job. That earns you $50,000, $100,000, $200,000. You know, you may well be that skilled and that awesome at whatever job you're walking into, but just walking in, you need to go in at entry level, whether that's a dollar an hour or $10 an hour. And it all depends on the job and what you're doing and uh, the amount of work that you end up doing for that company. Uh, so laws that prohibit, prohibit employment at any wage... Uh, it's relevant because it causes uh, unemployment as the demand curves are falling. If the minimum wage is raised just meagerly, you know, maybe a dollar or so, it the consequence is it disemploys and permanently, uh, you know, makes it impossible to hire those that would have been hired in in between those two rates or even lower. So that ends up disproportionately uh, hurting those who are less skilled typically uh, younger teenage workers, and also, unfortunately, it disproportionately uh, disemploys the minorities. And that's just the way it happens. Uh, because, typically speaking, uh, the lowest wage er earners, at least uh, back in Rothbard's time, were blacks and teenagers. That's just the way it was. Uh, and it's unfortunate that it was that way, but, you know, that's history for you. So... You know, the minimum wage doesn't cause unemployment, right? Well, of course it doesn't. Uh, so, you know, why should we stop at the $15 an hour that Seattle's at? Why not make it, you know, $100 an hour, $1,000 an hour, and $1 million an hour? That would solve poverty, right? Well, they say, oh, no, 
raising it too much would cause too much problems. That would really cause inflation issues. Well, of course it does. And raising it even one fucking penny causes the same damn problem. So obviously minimum wage advocates don't even pursue their own logic. Because if they push it to such heights, virtually the entire labor force will be disemployed. That is a fact of the market. In short, you can have as much unemployment as you want simply by pushing the legally minimum wage high enough. So Rothbard, he's got a great article uh, on Mises.org called Outlawing Jobs and Minimum Wage. Check that out. I've straight up quoted it a few times here already. Uh, so let's talk about this Forbes article. Let's see how much time I've got left. So uh, I can ramble for a little bit. So in this Forbes article, uh, they're talking about the $15 minimum wage, and uh, the article says, we can predict the effects of Seattle's $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, through it, it says, you know, obviously modest increases in minimum wage don't seem to have much effect on unemployment levels, uh, but we clearly understand that you know jumping up to $100 an hour won't work. We can also say that a dollar an hour doesn't work either because you know no one's going to ever want to get paid that little. Um, they say research tells us that once we get to 45 to 50 percent of the median wage, then we do start to see significant unemployment effects. This $15 an hour in Seattle will be around 60 percent of the local median wage. Uh, we can therefore expect to see reasonably large unemployment effects. Uh, so, you got a college grad or a high school grad willing to do the same job at the same price, or are you going to hire? They think that they're going to go for the college grad. Okay, cool, whatever. We'll, we'll roll with that. So, anyways, um, this Forbes writer uh, was at a place called SeaTac, uh, and minimum wage is already at fifteen dollars an hour. Uh, he's he said, while attending an event at a SeaTac hotel last week, I met two women who received the $15 an hour minimum wage. SeaTac has implemented the new law on January 1st. I met the women while they were working. One was a waitress and the other was a cleaning lady. Are you happy with the $15 wage? I asked the full-time cleaning lady. It sounds good, but it's not good, she said. Why? I asked. I lost my 401k, health insurance, paid holiday, vacation, and no more free food, she added. The hotel used to feed her. Now she has to bring her own food. Also, no overtime, she said. She used to work extra hours and received overtime pay. What else, I asked. I have to pay for parking, she said. Then I asked the paid part-time waitress, you know, who was part of the catering staff. Yes, I've got $15 an hour, but all my tips are now much less, she said. Before the new wage law was implemented, her hourly wage was $7, but her tips added to much more than $15 an hour. Yes, she used to receive uh, free food and parking as well. Now she has to bring her own food and pay for parking. So in this particular instance, these people lost all their benefits. You know, even coming in at seven, eight, nine dollars an hour, these people were getting insurance, uh, a, a retirement plan, paid holiday, vacation time, free food. I mean, when you work in the hotel industry, at least as a front desk person, not so much as a as a cleaning lady in my experience. I'm not a cleaning lady ever, but uh, <laughs> knowing my housekeepers as I do. You know, they get breaks and stuff like that. I don't. I work at the front desk for eight hours. Sometimes I have a two-hour period where I'm not interacting with anybody whatsoever. And I can work on paperwork or work on laundry, in the case of my hotel. They're not getting dick anymore. They're getting $15 an hour, but that's it. And that's not enough to pay for the fact that they have to pay for parking at their own workplace. That's a little bit ridiculous. So Forbes, you know, shows just perfectly in this article with their own statements that the $15 minimum wage is not working. It will not work, will never work, and it amounts to tyranny. So in order to keep the video reasonably short, little, right around 30 minutes, I don't want to go over my time slot. I'm going to thank you guys for watching. This has been Adam Brown of Liberty Souls Republic I, saying peace and love and liberty.